Hello, everyone. Come on up, everybody. Come on up. Here we go. He's going to be tweeting. We have a very special guest, Anson's dog, Mac. This is his first panel. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Chad Oaks. I'm uh, one of the producers on the show. Uh, uh, my company, uh, Nomadic Pictures, in partnership with E1 and Endemol, uh, are the producers and the financiers of the show. Uh, it's such a great pleasure to be doing this here in our own hometown. Um, for you that, that don't know anything about, uh, or have only heard a little bit about Hell on Wheels, it is uh, broadcast on AMC in both the United States and Canada. We're now Saturdays at 9 p.m. We just started shooting the fourth season this week, season four. And hopefully we will uh, accidentally tell you a little bit about what's going on this season. I'd like to uh, introduce our showrunner and executive producer, Mr. John Wirth. Executive producer and writer, Mr. Mark Richard. This young man here, Anson Mount, who plays Colin Bohannon. Robin McKeevy, and she plays Eva. Kasia Kaprinsky, who plays Ruth. Christopher Heiderall is the Swede. <laughs> Phil Burke, Canadian Phil Burke, who plays Mickey. <laughs> and Mr. Don Norwood Psalms. <laughs> All right, well, uh, what I'm supposed to tell you is we're going to do 30 minutes of scripted questions, and the last 15 minutes will be question and answers, which is, really is the fun. So if we go fast, we can give you guys more time to ask questions. At 2.15, after uh, this, they're in halls D and E. There is a free autograph signing for everybody that's up here. So that's at 2.15 afterwards. All right, so we'll start. We'll start with the boss man. All right, Mr. John Wirth, season four will be your second season as showrunner. How do you feel the series has changed since coming aboard the show? Um, I, I got nothing. <laughs> um, I, first of all, it was really, um, it, it was really, it, just a stroke of luck that I ended up with the opportunity to come on this show and I couldn't be happier to be a part of this thing which was pretty amazing when I got here and I think through a confluence of events um, and dogs uh, it's just gotten better and um, I think uh, you know what what we set out to do last year was tell better stories in a better way I think we, uh, to some degree, accomplished that. Uh, we have a terrific writing staff, amazing crew. These are most of our wonderful actors. And um, this year, I think we're gonna, I think we've got some crazy stuff in store for you. So, uh, none of which I'll tell you unless you really press me, then I might. Uh, I'm gonna jump to another question here. Uh, we got moved from Sunday nights to Saturday nights. How did you feel about that move by the network? Listen, um, you know, the prevailing wisdom on, uh, with the networks is that Saturday night's sort of a dead night for television. And um, I couldn't disagree more. You know, our ratings ticked up last year over the first two seasons. 
Uh, we doubled the uh, ratings for AMC on Saturday night. We improved our own demographics. Um, you know, we have, there are like 14 hours of westerns on AMC during the day, so you have a nice big 14 hour lead in. Um, so um, I was very pleased with how we performed on Saturday night, and I'm very happy to be there, and we'll be back there uh, this year starting in August. Great. Mr. Richard, we're going to jump to you. You've been a part of the series now since the very beginning. Um, how has this show changed over the years, and you, are you happy with the, the direction that it's going? Uh, I am, and uh, before, I want to just get off book for one second, Chad, because uh, there's, a, there's a lot of people who uh, are stars on this show who aren't able to you know, be here uh, this afternoon. But I just want to single out one person who I just see is in the audience, and you've all seen his work. It's the amazing Marvin Rush. And if it, Marvin, could you stand up for a second? Let me just uh, yeah. come on, Marvin. Hey, Marvin. Come on, Rush. Yes, indeed, Marvin Rush. He. One thing about our show that everybody comments on is, is the look of the show, and he's our director of photography. And um, you've seen his work because I don't know how many hundreds of uh, episodes of Star Trek you did, Marvin, um, and uh, so many shows. He is really a cultural icon. He makes the show look like it does. He's just an artist. Um, one thing Marvin said yesterday on the set that I really uh, appreciated, he told, he, he told the crew, he said, own your art. He told everybody that. He thinks that everyone on the set is an artist. And I think that that attitude has translated into everything we do. So thank you, Marvin. Um, I think the show has gotten better. Yeah. I mean, people tune in to look at the show and to look at its look, and that's one aspect of it. Uh, after four years, we have gone from uh, a show that was episodic in nature, um, and one in which the main character solved most of his problems by shooting someone in the face, uh, which has, you know, limited possibilities as a writer and I'm sure as an actor after a while. And I think now the show has evolved into a place where uh, it's more novelistic, and so that people who watch it regularly now say that it's like reading a really good book. And I, I appreciate that. I think the, the characters have deepened, the storylines have deepened, and uh, our growing following reflects that. Is there anything that you can reveal to us here uh, about season four coming up, which, by the way, debuts in August, first week of August? Is there anything we can, uh, you can let us know about? You know, I probably shouldn't say yet because I don't think some of the people on the stage know. So I, let me no, talk. Yeah, can know. you please let yeah. us know what's going on for the rest of the season? No. I have no I, idea. I will say that, you know, Phil Burke, all, of, all these are my, some of my favorite characters. But uh, we're st we haven't taken, uh, at the beginning of the season at the board, we put Mickey becomes uh, governor of Wyoming. Or, and I thought, you know, that's just a good thing to aim for. You know, from I'm down for political office. I think I do quite well, to be honest. You know, I, I, there's sure a lot of governors started out in saloons, you know? <laughs> Once or twice. All right. Anson, over the last three seasons, Cullen has gone from being a man seeking revenge for his family's murder to the leader of the railroad, to a man stripped of his title and dignity, held captive by his nemesis, and now soon to be a father. How do you feel Cullen's evolution is as a character? Um, wow. Um, I, one of the touchstone words for me, I think starting third season, was maturation. Um, I think becoming an adult in a large way is um, learning that the world doesn't revolve around you. And hopefully that is something that, that you continue to realize um, uh, and thank you. After the gesture, it's. I think that's hopefully that's something that throughout your life you start you continue to realize has increased layers. Um, you know. I I I feel like every decade I re, I realize oh I thought I knew what that meant no I really am not the center of things, um, and I'm not sure what more to say about 
that than that. <laughs> okay, now you seem like an outdoorsy guy. Um, was Western, being a part of a Western, was that something that you always wanted to do? Yeah, I was, I was one of those kids who grew up, I, I literally, I'm not joking, I had, that, the, I had the white cowboy hat and the plastic sheriff's badge and the holster for my cap pistols. And I, there was this half fallen down tree in our front yard that I would pretend was a horse. And now I get paid to do the same thing. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Now, doing a Western, it's a genre that all actors want to do. What is the best part of, of doing a Western? Working with the horses, without a doubt. We have an amazing local wrangling company, John Scott Ranch. Takes very good care of us. Uh, keeps me, they've kept me alive for the past four years. I'm very thankful for that. Um, and, uh, the, you know, the, there are just things that you have to know about, even if you're comfortable on a horse, there are things you have to know about operating a horse on a set that you, you don't know unless someone teaches to you, and you just have to know that. Uh, and they have wonderful horses that are just broke, broke, man. Um, really, really great horses, and I, I love that part of the job. Cool, immensely. great. All right, Robin, Eva's had a tough year. Yeah, she, she did. It's been a past couple, couple, couple of tough Always years. Tough. She's lost her husband, she's lost her child, and now Elam, Elam's disappeared. We don't know where he is. How do you handle all the emotion that comes with playing with this character? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's kind of one of the things that I really love about Eva is that she has so much emotional baggage. And as an actor, that's a real treat to, to have that kind of history. Um, and to play a survivor who's always kind of battling her own, um, yeah, her own self-sabotage, including her current circumstances. Um, and for those of you who watch season three, you know that Eva gave away her baby and then um, Elam was pretty disappointed as a result. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's very challenging. Um, to, yeah, to give full energy to all those, you know, peaks and troughs throughout the season, and the writing is uh, supports that journey. So it's a real pleasure. Yeah. Great. Okay, this is an answer I wasn't going to ask, but it's on this page. <laughs> would you ever consider a tattoo like that on your face? Yes, I would. You know, <laughs> when would you ever consider giving away a baby? <laughs> yes. You would. Are you kidding? Ladies and gentlemen. I'm not ready for motherhood. Hey, man, rock and roll. But thank you. There you go. This is the point where the panel just goes south. <laughs> um, yeah, I would love to have that tattoo. I'm very attached to it, and I forget to take it off most days when we finish work. But in another lifetime, I think this lifetime I'm tattoo-free, but in another lifetime I would love to be covered in tattoos. I think they're brilliant. Yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah. Kasha. Last season, you could see a sparkle in Ruth's eyes when she was around Cullen. But little does she know, she's married and soon to be, he's soon to be a dad. He's married. Ruth isn't married. Did you say she or he? He. Never mind. You, never mind. Cullen. Okay. okay. Do you think she'll feel the same way about when Cullen returns? Well, I feel that Ruth's primary goal in life is to well, at least her renewed goal in life is to save souls. And I think any, any influence on a person that is productive and good and pure, I think she considers that to be the best outcome she could hope for. So the fact that Cullen is now married with a baby, I think if anybody's put in that situation, I think it, it cultivates strength and it cultivates um, purity of motive. So I think that's something she would be inspired by and happy to see. And also, I think that, well, hello, well, would you care to add? <laughs> anyway, um, so I think that being able to, well, this ties into, um, hello, Taden. Um, this ties into Ruth's relationship with Ezra, who is her new surrogate child. And he's right there. Stand up, mister. Have a little wave around. Hey. There he is. This is our Ezra. 
Um, Caden Marks. Well, this is what I was going to next, right. next time, Kash, is Ruth's become a, a surrogate mother to Ezra. Tell us a little right. bit about that storyline. Well, oh, I preempted your big ovation. But anyway, um, I think that people find it easiest to confront their problems or to dissect their problems when they are presented with a, a reflection of such. So I feel that Ezra is a conduit for, um, through which Ruth can atone um, and ameliorate her wrongs and, and pour all of her best self into creating a positive force in this life. So I think she sees Ezra as her salvation in many ways and a little as pet a project. As I beg your pardon? As your psychiatrist. As my psychiatrist. Ezra, having that other thing to talk about is what you're meaning. True. Oh, fair enough. He's going to stop you from getting all fatal attraction with Anson and the new girl. Well, here's hoping. I think that, um, I think that, I feel that being in the presence of a child is a very sobering and, um, Existential. Cleansing. Well, no, it, I feel it, it cleanses away everything and to see something so pure and to try and nurture that within yourself is, a. Uh, is only a good thing, but I'm sure you have much more to add, Phil. Phil has many thoughts on many subjects. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now we're, uh, by the way, the other moderator is Phil Burke, by the way. He's here all night long. <laughs> Tip his waiter. Uh, all right, Christopher Heiderall. The Swede is not a very nice man, but, uh, but in real life, you're a, like, you're a sweetie pie, you're a softie. How do you find this character, and uh, do you have to go to a dark place to find it? <laughs> Who wrote these questions? Not me. He's not a very nice man. <laughs> but you're the sweetest And whenever man. I turn on the television and that nasty man is on there, I change it because he's not nice. He's so mean to that nice man with the guns who shoots people in the face. <laughs> Such a nice man. Well, actually, um, I mean, everyone can attest here that I'm actually a horrible person and really... So it, it comes quite easily, and the, pretending to be nice is really the character that I play. Um, it's easy. It's, it's fun. I mean, the, 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 the scripts are all so well written. The character is a, is a gift, and, and every time I, I get a chance to play with Anson, you know, the sparks fly. It's so much fun, and I, and I miss also playing with, 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 playing with Phil. <laughs> So we meet up every week. I think week we wrap up everything about 3.30, boss. Uh, what do you got to say to that there, big fella? I'll see you on Stephen Avenue in a few hours. Nice. <laughs> Further south. It's going. <laughs> Next question. All right. Uh, a couple seasons ago, you took a real steep plunge off a very, very tall bridge. Was that you that did all that stunt work? Yes, it was. Um, no, there's a local guy who's actually been uh, uh, doubling me for uh, when I was here years ago doing um, Into the West. Uh, Greg Schlosser, known as um, Sleepy to his friends, probably to his enemies too. Uh, he he did the big the big jump, and then um, Bill Kent actually threw a dummy off the bridge, which was the the big belly flop. But a lot of people have asked, you know, how I could have how the character could have survived that. And I had to dig deep to find out how uh, someone could. But then I realized I forgot when I was writing, you know, character history, which is what a lot of actors do. And um, Tor Gunderson was actually in um, 1857. He was a belly flop champion in the fjords of Norway. So it was like nothing for him. All right. Phil, now it's your turn. Hey. Uh, all right, Mickey's come a long way since stepping foot in Hell on Wheels four years ago. He started off as a lesser half of the McInnes brothers and worked his way up, committing a few murders. According to who, lesser half? That's according, a bit pretty much everyone. According to the writers who wrote this. Um, <laughs> which, by the way, we have the rest of the writers for season four here. Where are they? Can everybody stand up? Where are they? Raise your hand. Stand up.
Yes, look at that. Bruce Romans, Tom Brady, Jamie O'Brien. Oh my God, Jennifer. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Wow, it's a wrap, is it? Wow. Um, all right, so uh, you've committed a few murders along the way to now being headed to run for the mayor of Cheyenne. This has been uh, quite a fun ride, obviously. Your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, again, great questions. Um, Okay, next one. Would yeah. you, would you and Mickey like to be friends? Oh yeah, man. Uh, uh, my ideal date with Mickey would um, start with a a slow candlelit dinner that would have a hockey game in the background. <laughs> Maybe even go down to the Saddle Dome, watch the Flames, and then uh, probably go to the James Joyce have a couple pints of Guinness, and really talk about ourselves, because I think that's one thing that Mickey, we don't really know his heart and soul. And if I could spend some time with Mickey McGinnis face to face, mano a mano, um, I think I'd really want to know what was going in in his heart and through his brain, and these are ridiculous questions. <laughs> Copy that. I'm, I'm sure the audience will have so much better questions. That was questions a beautiful answer. Bring it out. Yeah. All right, here we go, we got five minutes here. Don Norwood, Psalms has been a sturdy hand, a man of great character and loyalty. His story's been fun to watch. Were you prepared for where the writers have taken Psalms over the last three years, and where do you hope he's gonna go in the future? Yeah, I'm ready for everything, yeah. They <laughs> keep on writing, Mark, keep on writing, John, everybody. Uh, yeah, um, I don't know if I could say this, because for right now it's in past tense anyway. Uh, I was supposed to bite the dust, and uh, writers uh, loved what I was doing and decided to keep me on board. So everything after that is, is grace and mercy. So I'm real happy to be on board, be on the team, and continue to uh, develop songs in all aspects. Um, speaking of Marvin, just real quick, um, great, great guy, great vision. Uh, there's a scene where Elam comes back to uh, make amends with Psalms, you know, half-heartedly anyway. And um, we start out the scene with uh, some storytelling. They want to catch us mid-act, you know, mid-act. So Marvin was like, man, just, just start talking, right? Tell a story and then pick it up where the line start and we'll just, we'll catch you there. That way we can come like in the middle of something. And not only did that make a great shot, you know, for the scene and everything, but, you know, it's, it's got recorded anyway. So the writers got a hold of all this stuff I was, you know, ad-libbing. And it too became part of songs and storytelling and his womanizing and all this great stuff. So I look forward to a lot of the other dynamics that continue to add to songs and uh, getting a few of the scripts now, I can see he's going in some pretty big directions and the audience is gonna see a lot more of them. Cool, great. All right, I'm gonna ask a couple other personal questions before we turn it over, but there's two other people I, I and I know Mark and, and John would like to acknowledge. Uh, my business partner uh, and the other half of Nomadic Pictures is not here, he's in LA today, but uh, also Paul Curta, our other co-executive producer. Paul, where are you? There we are. A workhorse and a fine man. Uh, a couple other uh, questions. Uh, who's a jokester on set, guys? Do you really have to ask that? <laughs> Ridiculous questions! Anson. Boxers or briefs? Sorry, what? Boxers or briefs? None of your goddamn business. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the best? Did you write this or is this AMC? No, it's all me now. Who's the best on the horse? Who's the best person on the horse? I am, but no one will put me on one. That's a fact. <laughs> Whenever that you're ready. All right. Best restaurant in Calgary? Farm. Oh. Solid. There you go. Mm. Mono milk is pretty good. There we go. I like mono milk. Yeah. All right, what are you cooking? Done. All the right, uh, let's turn this over to the, uh, before this really goes south, over to the audience. I think there is two mics up here. Come on up and come ask a question, please. If you don't have a question, we probably have some here that you can you know. finish with. Right there, yes ma'am. Hi there, uh, thank you so much for doing this panel and congratulations to all of you on a fabulous show. 
Thank you. Thanks. Um, I was wondering, I, I read in the paper how Fargo, um, how that all happened, how you picked Alberta for that. I was wondering how Hell on Wheels ended up uh, having Alberta be the location. So Chad or whoever can yes, uh, answer well, that. Yes, well, as a producer of both those shows, I could tell you on the receiving end, um, uh, sometimes we develop something and we build it together with the networks, um, much like AMC came up with the idea with Endemol and then it came to us and then they found a studio. Uh, on, this, on this show, we had a relationship already with AMC because in 2005 we shot Broken Trail and it was nominated for 16 Emmy nominations. We won four. I did very well. It was AMC's very first scripted drama. And uh, for five years, uh, we kept on calling them saying, don't you want to make another Western? Don't you want to make another Western? And it wasn't their, they, they just, they were very intelligent about, it was, that was an easy place to fall. So they ended up with Mad Men, Breaking Bad, you know, all these other shows until they came around again when Helen Wheels landed on their desk in 2000 and it was, two, it was 2000. Shot the pilot? We shot the pilot in 2010. 2010 so it was yeah. 2009 when it came to us and they asked us, what do you think? And we just said, when do we start? And that's a very smart move on Chad's part because there's the other answer to your question is there's really nowhere else to shoot a Western set in the Great Plains on a television budget but Calgary. I mean, we could go to Wyoming or Montana. There's no crew. Did they shoot um, Brokeback Mountain? on our location, where we're at? In southern Alberta, yes. Yeah. 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 So it's got a good reputation for western plains, yeah. That was a spoiler for this season, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for your and Mickey's um, That nice man. <laughs> a nice man. Thank shoots you. Shoots people in the Thank place. you. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Chad, I just wanted to congratulate you guys on the uh, Ampio Awards a few weeks ago. That was pretty Thank good. Thank you. Billy. Hey. Your Leafs didn't do so good. Who do you have in the playoffs? I am not talking Leafs right now. <laughs> uh, they should have forewarned you when you walked into this pavilion. Uh, I am actually going to choose right now. I, I'm really excited for this Columbus-Pittsburgh series. I mean, Columbus is playing some serious, serious puck, which is dynamite. Yeah. Red Wings are going to win tonight. Yeah, and then I don't know about the series, but they will win tonight. So? Um, as far as the West is concerned, San Jose is... They're, they're a killer, and uh, I don't know. I'd love to see some underdog come in there. I'd love to see Joe Thornton finally get something, but uh, Columbus, man, if they could make, if they could shake a move, that'd be pretty awesome. So it's all up in the air right now, but uh, I'm still licking my wounds as far as the colossal collapse of the Toronto Maple Leafs. You and me both. <laughs> all right, mate. Cheers. Believe in the dream, brother. Okay. Yes, man with the eye patch. Hi guys, thanks for coming. I was just wondering. Great costume. You. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, trials and tribulations of doing a period historical piece when everybody's got an iPhone and Google and can call you on it. How much work are you guys putting into that? And and call us on like the details and the accuracy. Well, yeah, like I've done it myself. I look up what guns you guys are yeah. using. Yeah. And... Well, we have a really amazing crew from the ground up. So the research that the writers do is pretty impeccable. Um, and very accurate, so we have that brilliant template to work from. And then we have an armorer on set who knows their stuff. Brian Kent. Brian Kent. Yeah, our, our yeah. props people are, are great. Brian the actually, shot, sorry. The, the shotgun I got to use in uh, last season, episode five, was like a 130-something-year-old gun. Brian and, owns you know, one of the largest antique gun collections in North America. Yeah. Another reason we shoot in Calgary. So we're lucky we're completely surrounded by experts in every department, yeah. Right on. Just to uh, add on to that, this morning the props guy asked me for a speech from Ulysses S. Grant just in case we uh, feature in one of the shots uh, a newspaper that had a reprint of his. I mean, it goes down to a very granular level and we make mistakes sometimes, but we do uh, from the writers all the way down to the props on the day, we do try to police it. And we do get called on it, and uh, we, we do the best we can. Guns are the big thing, I think, that uh, p people have an eye for. Yes, ma'am. More, more of a couple of comments rather than questions. There was one question that was put uh, to, uh, to Anson. 
um, about him losing his dignity. And any of you who have watched the show, you know that Anson does not, or I should say Cullen, does not lose his dignity. Because Anson loses it at most days. <laughs> This is my time. You get to shoot. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Shut I'm gonna down. Sh I want to take you out for a drink, sweetheart. I think we get along famously. You, you got to hang out with us more often. I don't know, because I'm one of those Mormons that Colin married, so that just ain't going to work. <laughs> but anyway, and, and I think that there's a, a huge lesson in that, that no matter what an individual has been through, whether he's shooting people in the face or, or what. I mean, in those days, who didn't? That was the way of the West. But I think no matter what you have been through, you can keep your dignity. And another thing with the women on the show, do you, have you ever thought of yourselves as role models? And the reason I ask that is because in many TV shows and movies nowadays, women are not portrayed uh, such as yourselves, who have a great strength of character, who can go deep and pull from within to get through a crisis, whether it be physical, personal, emotional. Do you feel, have you felt that in this, this show you're a role model? I, I was raised by a feminist, so I have very strong feelings about how I represent women as, as an actress. Um, and we're fortunate enough to have a group of writers who respect women and who respect the women in their lives. So they're able to write female characters really well. And then what we bring to the roles is just a fortification of that. And we bring aspects of our own strength and personality. And oftentimes you're not able to do that because the writing won't allow for it or the characters are put in situations where you're objectified or an accessory to a man, and we're just so blessed to be able to be in full force as women. So thank you for it's observing really, that. It's really refreshing. Okay, it's your turn. Thank you. <laughs> I'll okay, see you after. We have, we have time for three more quick questions. Hi, my question is for uh, Christopher. Um, it's a well-known tradition that in shows people take to, or they like to take props off of, off of the shows. And in season one, you were wearing that awesome black uniform um, as the Swede. And I'm wondering if that would be something that you would have taken. Um, I, I would have loved to have taken that. It was, it was actually a deep green, oh, quite awesome. remarkable. It was Wendy Partridge who, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna say. And she, uh, her team cut and built that fantastic outfit in 36 hours. That's impressive. Very impressive. <laughs> Very impressive. Um, but I, I would love to have it, but no, I, it, I don't. Yeah, think me so. too. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, I, I remember seeing you on set for the first time at Up on the Horse when you come and ask for people to come out looking for, uh, I forget whoever you're chasing after. And I, I knew then you would like, be like the Vader of our show. I know what you're talking about. The hat the it goes with your shirt. Yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah, I knew then that that would be pretty classic, but you can continue, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir, go ahead. Hey, I was just uh, wondering, being that uh, I don't know how many other people here in the audience, I know the one guy who asked the question is that uh, I don't know how many people here that are actually extras, background actors on the show. I, I was uh, on last year and was out for uh, the first week uh, in, uh, out on set there and was just wondering how many people here we're actually background on the show, maybe. And if you have been, stand up. Yeah. Anybody involved nice. in the project? Oh, there we yeah. go. Superman was on the show. That's wonderful. And my question was actually, I know that uh, you probably guys get the question a lot, that some of you have natural accents that you either can naturally shut off and then other ones that you actually make an, or have an accent for the show and was just wondering how different or difficult it is to switch between the two. I once had the extreme pleasure of listening to a voicemail that Chris's father left for him. Oh, yeah. He was Norwegian. 
<laughs> and I went, oh. <laughs> I hope you don't mind me saying that. I, um, uh, my character's from Mississippi. I'm from Tennessee. Most people would not hear a difference. I do, so I listen to interviews with Brett Favre before I start <laughs> the season. Uh, this character's from Wicklow. My family's from Cork. I was born in Toronto. I spent a lot of time in Ireland growing up. I'm a bit of a mutt. The Irish accent isn't too hard for my ear, although I get in a lot of trouble when I go back to Ireland because they break my balls all the time. <laughs> Jesus, you, you, there's, there's no way. That's, that's not the accent at all, sir. There's no, that ah, feck, Phil. Jesus Christ almighty. You're absolutely, you're, you know, you're disgracing the bloody family at all. You know that? Sorry, I'll go get the next round. <laughs> well, I find that using an American accent actually helps me learn my lines. It almost has a musical cadence that it aids in the absorption of the lines into my brain. So, but I can't, I can't imagine speaking with an American accent all the time. I would find that very disorienting. I can only do it when I'm doing my scenes and then it's part of the character. And it actually helps in portraying the character to feel that much more different from my own self. Yeah, I feel the same. I hate acting in my own accent. I find it really exposing and it's having um, an accent to work with just gives you that extra layer of character and buffer from your own self. So you're less vulnerable, which is brilliant. You've got a whole bunch of stuff you can pile on top and then you can really party. Yeah. And, and sometimes more vulnerable, I, I think, too. It, it resonates in a different part of the body and, and brings out another aspect of yourself that is only that character. Cool. Thank you. One Great last question. question. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Go ahead. Hey. Um, <laughs> Love your outfit, by the way. Yeah, it's nice. Thank you. Brown shirts are nice. What's in your. Um, Holster thingy. Nothing. An empty holster? Wrong answer. It's terrible. It's symbolic. <laughs> Be careful the questions you ask. Um, what does shooting a Wester uh, compare to any other projects that you've all done in the past? Is it? It's like the coolest ever. Yeah, it's yeah. cool. It's really fun. It's our it's it's our version of the martial arts film. It's <laughs> it's it's it's. it's not just action, it's, it's a part of, it's culturally what makes us North Americans, you know. There's something to that that I think is more than just action or genre. Yeah, it's fun. The lawlessness and the recklessness is kind of innate in everything you do on set. And because we're never in a studio, we're always in the mud and in the earth. It's really fun and you just feel like you're playing like a kid. And so, that, yeah, it's great. It, it's yeah. humbling, too. The, we can't hide from nature. When, when the weather comes through, we, we have to deal with it. And so often, uh, it's used in telling our story. Some of the most amazing shots that Marvin has been able to get off over the years has included uh, the, uh, just that shot. I always think of the shot at the end of um, season one with Anson. Yes. And it, and it reflected so much what was going on in, in uh, Cullen Bohannon's world. And Marvin captured it so uh, beautifully as a juxtaposition to what uh, Anson was doing. It was amazing. So, uh, you know, we yeah. can't hide from it. It's great. And when you're, like, walking around and, like, there's just, like, a whole bunch of whores or something, you know, you're just, like, turning a corner and then you're like, oh, whoa, and they look so good. Like in the dressing is what I'm talking about there. And like the production designer, John Blackie, like that, there's so much detail in Incredible. the actual, you know, like the, the set. Like you go around, you just turn down the street and there's the bathhouse that looks like a bathhouse like it would in 1869, I think we're in now. Seven. 70? 80. 67. 67. 68. 68. 
68. Yeah, we're 68. Yeah, we've, this is season four. We got it. I think. <laughs> and Cheyenne is, uh, is incredible. Yeah, uh, oh, wait till you see this place. Everything, you go into each building, the bank has a bank vault. Yeah. You know, the, the rooms have working doors and- And the hotel has a staircase that goes up. Right, and not to nothing. Right, exactly, so. Like and like, there's it. doors. <laughs> it's pretty kick-ass, I just gotta say. Great, thank you. Well, you could tell that we don't like to have fun together. Um, it's been snowing outside. We got stuck in a tent, and I see there's close to 400 people here today. Thank you for coming out. And, thank uh, you all. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you very much. And we hope you enjoy season four, Hell on Wheels. <laughs>